Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Good morning. It's a beautiful day to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we are very glad that you are here uh, celebrating with us our Savior and getting a chance to do that in, with the gathered worship of God's people. If you are a guest with us, we're very glad that you're here today. We would love for you to take the tear tab in your worship guide. A couple in our previous service did just that. They filled it out. They put their name and contact information on it, handed it to me as, as, uh, as they left the worship service. And I'll get a chance to follow up with them and see how their worship was and just get a chance to know them. Part of our job as pastors and staff and elders is to make sure we know the folks that are here. And we're glad that you're here. For those of you that are members and regular attenders, a week from today, uh, Sunday, June, January, June, it's not June yet, January 21st, uh, we will have our first member meeting of the year. It'll be 530 right here in our sanctuary. And then we'll gather for Finger Foods after that in our fellowship hall. We do have some ministry information to share with you, things going on in the life of our church, as well as a motion from our property committee regarding replacing a couple of doors. So that's a decision you as a congregation will have to help us make. So we want you to be here next Sunday afternoon at 530 for that. Our Wednesday programming is uh, back in gear with Awana with our children and squads with our middle school students and an adult Bible study as we're working through the topic of eschatology on Wednesday nights, and we'd love for you to join us for that as well. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me as we begin our worship service with a reading from Scripture from uh, the book of Revelation. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Almighty God, yours is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. Let's sing this to him today and about him and for him. Let's join our voices together. Everyone singing.
you are great and you perform wonders, God. Let's sing about that now as we sing, How Great Thou Art.
grateful for all the gifted people here at Wilkesbury Baptist Church that lead us in worship in so many different ways. If you are one of those gifted people who can sing uh, our choir practices on Wednesday nights after our Bible study, love for you to join us, uh, join Mike and his team as they uh, help us participate in worship leadership every single Sunday. I've been grateful for Pastor Tad these last uh, two weeks and then today, uh, preaching this sermon series on the life of Moses, part of uh, part of my job is to make sure that others have a chance to preach and teach, and uh, part of our job at the church is to raise up others who can do just that. And in our uh, model of leadership now with a plurality of elders, one of our obligations is to make sure that we present to you good elder candidates and that we affirm them in the life of the church, and we're going to do that here in just a moment. I'm going to ask Gary Buffalo and Steve Robinson to come forward. Uh, Gary and Steve were two men that we presented to you last fall. And uh, they, uh, they were presented as candidates to serve as elders at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. And you overwhelmingly affirmed them to serve. They made their first meeting in December and then participated in the meeting in January. And they've both been ordained. Steve is a retired pastor. He's already been ordained to the gospel ministry. Gary served uh, on a very uh, various number of church staffs. Uh, not also, our church staff, a number of years ago, he runs his own marketing business. And they will serve as lay elders here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to commission them through a time of prayer. I can't tell you how wonderful of an experience it is for me to join with these other brothers, these other elders, a monthly to pray with them for you as a congregation, to pray about what's going on in the life of our church. It's been a glorious privilege. And so today in our worship service, we're going to pray over Vince and over Gary and pray for you as a congregation. Our other elders are going to gather around them. Vince and Gary are going to kneel here at the altar and we're going to pray for them. Or, or, or I'm sorry, Steve and Gary are going to kneel here at the altar. Vince, our other lay elder, is going to pray for all of us. Sorry about that. Uh, trying to confuse everybody. Vince, you come and lead us in time of prayer. Gary, you and Steve kneel and we'll pray for you. Good morning, our prayer partners this week. Our Sunday school class is the Blessed Believers class. It is taught by Miss Alabama and Terry Carroll at 930 in room 113. Uh, also, our prayer partner is the Wycliffe Bible Translators, Adam and Ruth Huntley, and our unreached people group are the Turkish people. So let's join our hearts together in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today. We realize you are a powerful, a great, awesome God, as we just sang how great you are. And Lord, we're so thankful for your power, for your majesty, so thankful for your creation. But most of all, Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us. When we were a people that was unlovable, you still loved us so much you sent your son to die for us. And Lord, today as we pray, we're so grateful and thankful for this church. We're thankful we have this beautiful place to come and worship and to praise you. We're thankful for all the leadership in this church, their dedication and hard work and their service. And Lord, we're so thankful for this congregation and we just ask a special blessing today upon each one that is here today. Just bless each home that's represented here in a very, very special way. And our prayer partners, Lord, our, our, the, uh, the Bible translators, Adam and Ruth Huntley, Lord, we just lift them up to you in our prayers. We just pray that you'll just be with them in their work and bless them. And the unreached people group, the Turkish people, Lord, we realize there are so many that do not know you and so many that are, are serving uh, other religions. Lord, we just pray for missionaries and witnesses to go into those lands and lord we just pray for the blessed believer sunday school class today that leadership there sister isla brother terry lord we just lift them up to you and pray for them in a special way and lord as we go into a new year we're so thankful for our new deacon board lord we just lift them up to you our, our new deacons that are starting to serve the ones that has been serving we just pray that you'll just be with them and just lead them that they'll look to you for guidance. And to serve as an elder, Lord, what an honor and a privilege it is. And we just ask our prayers upon the elder board today. 
And Lord, today in a very special way, we do pray for Brother Steve and Brother Gary. As they begin this journey, Lord, just lead them, guide them, direct them, comfort them. Just give them the wisdom and the strength that they need. We pray today for our nation. Today, Lord, we realize it's a divided nation going into a, an election year. And the world round about us, so many wars and rumors of war. But Lord, we just pray for peace. We just pray for your leadership and guidance and our understanding. Most of all, we pray for the lost. We realize we live in a lost and dying and a broken world. And Lord, we realize that you are the answer. And today, we just ask that you'll be with the remainder of this service. We lift up Brother Tad. We just ask that you'll just hide him behind the cross. Just use him in a very, very mighty way. Lord, what a wonderful sermon he preached earlier. We pray that you'll just give him the strength and just lead and guide and direct him. And Lord, once again, we close by giving you all the praise, the honor, and the glory because it's you and you alone are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This full room and full voices has been a powerful testimony already this morning, so I'm going to ask you to keep that up. We're going to sing another hymn called On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand This Morning. It's got a little bit of a call and response in the chorus. You'll pick it up, I promise, like any good hymn. If you sing it once, you'll pick it up in verses two. So let's stand and sing together again this morning on Jordan's Stormy Banks.
some encouraging singing. We're going to keep worshiping this morning. We're going to sing Lord of my life. Keep joining us as you can. A sky without a north star, a ship without an anchor, caught up in the current, a heart is prone to wander. All the roads I've taken lead me back to nowhere. When you're the destination, and you're the way to get there, you can have it all. The song I sing Be my guiding light Savior of my soul Be the Lord of my life Every step I take Always by my side I am yours, you are mine Be the Lord of my life Oh, oh, oh. Thank y'all for letting me preach these last three weeks. It's been a great series, been a wonderful time. I, um, I'm always thankful um, when I get to preach, and Pastor Chris is just a great leader, a uh, humble leader, and allowing me to have three weeks, and he's been here. Um, that speaks a lot for leaders and for pastors. Not many pastors stay uh, in the congregation when someone else is preaching. They usually, you know, go off, they take a, you know, take a vacation. But Pastor Chris has been here all three weeks taking notes, and we, uh, it's always fun Monday when we get together and learning that, you know, understanding he's learned some new things. Some things have come out to him, and that's, that's a humbling and challenging thing. And it's been, it's been challenging for me to walk through three weeks uh, trying to plan ahead, trying to make sure it all comes together and doing time management. So thank y'all for, for allowing us to have this. It's great that we're able to, to do this together. Uh, we've been in Moses, kind of studying and walking through Moses. And one of the things that I've, I've gained most about this study with Moses is that he is a real person. 
And many times, even myself, I've heard these stories, I've read the stories, I've grown up with these stories about Moses, and sometimes we take characters in the Bible and treat them just like that, characters. We treat them as fictional people that they can't be like us, they're on a different scale, but as we've learned, as I've learned, Moses is just like you and me. He is a normal human being that God used to do miraculous things. And we can do that and really bringing out who Moses was. And we've spent the first week talking about the identity of Moses. He kept asking himself who he was. He didn't really know how he needed to define himself. The labels didn't quite fit. And what we learned was God said, it's not about who you are. It's about that I am with you. And we learn about God being with us at all times, being the great I am, being the God of the present, the one that's going to walk with us, that's not going to abandon us. And then we learned that Moses had struggles. He had anxiety in his life, and he had stresses that were distracting him, and he was scared that God's presence was going to be removed from him, and he did not like that. He didn't want to live in a way where he didn't have God's presence with him, so he asked God for his presence. He needed that reassurance that we all need sometimes. When we've discovered who we are, discovered what we need to be, and we still need to be reassured, and we need that moment where God's goodness comes and bring, comes into our, in our life and shows us who we need to be. God stayed with Moses, instructed Moses, and today we're going to talk about Moses' acceptance of his identity and what that means. And, and I apologize for, for in your notes and the bulletin, you don't have you know, blank spaces because we're going to be doing a Bible study this morning. We're going to cover two passages of Scripture, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to write whatever notes you need. Because it's a lot to cover, a lot going on in these passages. Because Moses accepting who he was meant a lot. And it was challenging and worked through. So turn with me to Numbers chapter 20. Look at two pivotal moments at the end of Moses' life that allowed him to accept his identity in God. So as you're turning to Numbers 20, what's happened since he's been to Sinai, after he saw God's glory, he spent more time with God. He, create, he constantly went with the tent of meeting. He went to Mount Sinai. And God kept having conversations with him and telling him, this is what's pleasing to me. This is what you need to write down. What is a pleasing sacrifice? What, is going, what am I going to accept? What is really holy? It all goes back to that first encounter that Moses had with God when God said, come, for this is holy ground. Separate yourself. Separate everything you have so you can focus on God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can focus on the great I Am. It's all about holiness to God. God tells him, okay, this is what a holy sacrifice is. This is how you should go about a holy sacrifice. This is what it means to be a holy people of God and how you are to handle yourselves with other people and, and the challenges and when there's mistakes made. How do you make up for it and how do you live in a community? He gives you all of these guidelines and Moses listens to it. And then we get to Numbers chapter 20, which is a, which is a pivotal moment. And it starts off with says, Moses, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. Now, I'm going to stop right there because you need some background on why this is important. I had, I had read this passage many times, but it occurred to me what this place was. So previously in Numbers 13 and 14, about 40 years prior to this, this event, there was a rebellion that occurred. Moses took them off of Mount Sinai. He had had the, the tablets written. He had been teaching the, the Israelites what it meant to be holy, how to worship properly. And then they get to this point, to the promised land. God does exactly what he says. He says, Moses, I want you to lead the people to the promised land. So they're on the doorstep. It's, in a, it's a couple of day journey, maybe a month at the most to get into the promised land. They're right there. And Moses says, okay, what we want, I want to spend, I want to spend 12 spies, one from each tribe. We're going to go look at the land. We're going to survey the land. We're going, to, we're going to plan ahead on how we want to go into this land, if there's going to be challenges, obstacles. And so they go, and these, 10, these 12 guys come back. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, are fired up. They just saw the promised land. They come back to Moses excited, celebrating. God, guys, we got to go. This is our promised land. It's better than what was described to us. It's not just a land flowing of milk and honey. It is the promised land. It is above every expectation we could ever have. God is with us. God told us to go. Let's go. 
two versus the other ten. The other ten didn't think that. The other ten couldn't get past all the obstacles. When the other ten looked at the promised land, they saw these, these mighty men, these giants, the hardships, the struggles, and said, I, we can't do it. We're not going to make it. We're going to die. We've got to turn back. We don't, we don't need the promised land. We're good. We're, we're happy with where we're at. We're confident. We're, we're comfortable in this moment. We don't need to go further because it's going to be challenging. And some of us may, it, it may lo- lose our lives. And Joshua and Caleb still pushing Moses and saying, no, we got to go. Guys, let's go. Well, majority won. They took a vote. Majority won. Ten to two. Joshua and Caleb lost. And it's known as the Great Rebellion. Because the Israelites chose not to follow God, not to listen to God, to choose their own comforts, their own selfishness, and push them into a 40-year journey through the wilderness. Because God says, this doesn't please me. This is not the respect, the trust you need. I have given you everything. I've given you miraculous signs. I have given you pillars of clouds, pillars of fire. Yet you don't trust me to lead you into this way? That's fine. The 40, these 40 years are going to wipe out a generation. Those that have rebelled, you will not enter the promised land. You can't go in there. I'm going to wipe the ground from you. We will start over. So you're going to spend 40 years. And so we get back, where we pick up the story in chapter 20, we're back at that point. We're back at the same place we started 40 years ago. We've just been walking around in a circle, and we finally land here. So I want you to take a moment and think about what Moses is going through. He's a leader. Some of you, I have, I'm looking at the congregation, there are a lot of leaders in this room. There are people that have held high parts in companies, that have led lots of people. And imagine the times that somebody went against you. They went against your word. They went against your leadership. You spoke as God commanded you and you were passionate and you were full and you were like, this is the route we need to go. And they went against you. And they basically said, they will not follow you. I'm not following you, leader. You remember those moments, right? You remember where you were, what you were feeling. And I can imagine Moses, those feelings are coming up. That frustration, anger is hitting. He's thinking, oh, here we go again. Is it going to be the same? So he's at that spot. Bad memories take place. And then what happens? The end of verse 1, there Miriam died and was buried. His sister, the one that watched him on the Nile, the one that made sure he was safe, the one that made sure the princess would walk by and he would go into Egyptian royalty, the sister that made sure that his mom would raise him for three years, the caregiver, the protector, the older sister has passed away. Now, were they on the best of terms? Probably not. Remember how I told you about the rebellion before? Miriam was part of that rebellion. Miriam was one of the ones questioning his, her little brother, Moses. So there probably were ill feelings, but I imagine Moses is grieving in this moment. I've, I'm the youngest of four. I have three older sisters. So I don't have the experience of, of burying one of my sisters, one of my sisters passing away. But I can imagine it is a sad moment. Part of you is gone. You know, one of his protectors, one of his guides is not with him anymore. So there's grieving, there's mourning that happened. And so he's got the the feelings of the past upon him. He's got the grief of the present. And let's look what else happens in verse 2. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the desert and we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates and there is no water to drink. He's back to the place that his people rebelled against him because they were complaining and his people are complaining again. And if we, if we want to bring it into reality, they're really complaining about first world problems. 
They're not talking about, oh, it's hard and it's hot and we don't have anything. You know, they're not even talking about we don't have food. They're talking about these luxuries of life. They're talking not having pomegranates and grapevines and figs and then waters at the end. It's like, oh, yeah, and by the way, we don't have water either. Out of all the things that they need is the water, but they're focused on these luxuries. What is, is funny to me, and as I was reading and I missed the first couple of times, is it says that these, this is a generation that never saw Egypt. Remember the rebellion happened. Moses said all of the, this generation will be wiped away. This is the generation that left Egypt and was wandering up to that moment. They got to experience God's pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. And now this generation never saw Egypt. Never saw Egypt. So why would they know about figs? Why would they know about pomegranates? Why would they know about grains? Because the generation before them talked about those things. Let's go back to Egypt because that's where this luxury living was. Where's the slavery? Where's the hardships? Where's the beatings that took place? Where's all the things that this generation, the generation before them, went through? They didn't pass any of the goodness of God. Where's the story of them seeing God come into the tent meeting? It's not there. So as I'm reading this, the first question I'm asking is, what gener- what's the generation teaching? What's the previous generation teaching the following generation? And what is our generation, my generation, teaching the next generation? Are they just learning about the hardships? Are they just focusing on the complaining instead of the goodness of God and the holiness of God and seeing the miraculous deeds of God? So I was a little bummed out, and and I had an interesting, I had an illustration just come this past, in between services. So I'm sitting out there, and I was talking about generations, and there was a little little child, maybe two, three, and he had a cookie, because they got, we have cookies in the fellowship hall, right? Most of y'all go in there before coming in here. You get a cookie, and I was just being very relational to this child, and I said, hey, where's my cookie? Did you get me a cookie? He went back in. And brought me a cookie. So I had a moment of conviction that there's hope for our generation. If we focus on the right things as leaders, as adults, if you focus on the people that are watching you and you interact with, the new generation will see the kindness, the goodness of other things. But they, this people didn't. And so Moses is struggling with this. I've been there. And, and once again, I got convicted just today about having this idea There's not, that generation is lost. And Moses probably had that same moment because look at what he did. He's, verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. He did what every honorable, godly leader would do. Frustration hits, emotions are high, you're confused, you're anxious, you don't know where to go, you go to God. You go to worship. You fall face down and you say, God, I need you in this moment. I need your direction. He did exactly what he was supposed to do as a great leader, a great example. And he falls face first. Him and Aaron, God, Help me. And it says that God's, the glory of the Lord appeared to them. What a moment. What a moment of worship. When you're frustrated and down, God's glory comes. You're uplifted. And then the Lord said to them in verse 7, verse 8, Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out in its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. Now, I want, if, you're, if you're taking notes, if you have a pencil in hand, you need to underline the word speak. That's an important word, speak. Because that was the instructions. We need to be clear. Moses said, take the, take the staff, speak to the rock. Okay? Very clear. Take the staff, speak, water comes. Simple process. What does Moses do? Verse 9. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels. Must we, once again, if you're taking notes, circle that word we. We bring you water out of this rock. 
Then Moses raised his arm, struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community and their livestock drank. Did y'all pick up the problem? Some problems with that statement. God says, speak to the rock, very clear on his instructions, and Moses strikes the rock. But before he even gets to striking the rock, when he, adju- when he goes to the assembly, he says, we. We. He is putting himself equal to God. He has taken his moments He let the emotion get ahead of him where he put himself equal to God and said, we can do this, God. Reality, God can. We can't do anything. God is the only one that can take take water out of a rock. God is the only one that can work miraculous minds. We can't do anything. God chooses to use us as his tools to, to get the kingdom of God at hand. He gives those things, but we do nothing. It's God. Moses should have said, God will bring forth what rock? Because our God is a holy God. Our God is different. Our God cares about you in the community and doesn't want to see you suffer. Our God will do it. No, he says we. That's a problem. His emotions led him to be bigger than what he was. And he struck the rock. Now, why would he strike the rock? Well, previously, 40 years before this, he struck that rock and water came out of it. God has said, hey, take your staff, hit the rock, water will come out. Same same pace. So in this moment of emotion high, he's not thinking properly. Because emotions cause you to break the will of God. Emotions will cause you to miss the mark. Emotions cause us to sin more than anything else. Emotions allow you make you react instead of be proactive. Emotions cloud your judgment. It clouds your ability to think through the process and you just act upon what you feel. And the world tells you that. The world tells you that if that's just how you feel, you can't change that. You can't change the way you feel. You can't change the way you act. Just work out at your emotions. No. God says, be self-controlled and listen to me. Emotions will lead you astray. Emotions lead you down a path. And if we're honest, we've all done that. The sins we, we had this week were probably out of emotion. Our rage got the best of us. Our desires got the best of us because that's what emotions are. They lead us down the wrong path. It causes sin, and that's exactly what Moses did. He, he got so out of sorts that he went back to his comfort zone. He went back to the things he knew. Which also tells me that when he was worshiping, he was not fully there. He did it maybe for show. He was like, okay, I need to go to the tent of meeting, and that's where I'm going to go because I want God to show up. God shows up, and then he doesn't listen fully because what he heard did not meet up with what he wanted to do. Emotions had led him to a place of entitlement. I'm sure frustration hits. When I get frustrated and I get angry and I get mad and there's rage there and leader and people are not following my instructions. If people would do just the way I tell them to do, things would be great. Been there. And I'm sure Moses had that moment of God, well, I was going to hit something. I was either going to hit someone or I was going to hit something. And I felt in that moment that something was probably better than someone. He tried probably to justify it. I would have done the same thing, but it wasn't what God wanted him to do. So God responds, verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters at Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he showed himself holy among them. Once again, underline holy. The reason God provided for this ungrateful community. They did not deserve that water. They didn't deserve it because they were complaining. They didn't deserve it because their leader failed them. But God being holy, being different, by giving blessings when you don't deserve it, that's why he did it. Because he wanted the tale to be, hey, God is holy. He's not like the gods of Egypt where they would have Strike, they will strike you dead. You don't agree with them, they will rid you from this earth. No, this God is different and holy. They want to, He provides. 
Our God will not leave you alone. Our God will not provide for you. He will always give you blessings. You just have to accept them and take them and and focus on them. That's what the whole point is, to focus on God's holiness. He took Moses out of the equation and said, I am holy. Focus on me. There's consequences to his, his disobedience. There's consequences to sin. It is true that through the cross, your sins are forgiven. As believers now, that when you come and you confess your sins to God and you lay them at the cross, you, it's gone. But, and they're wiped away from God's eyes, but there are still consequences. For every action, there's a reaction. For every action you do, there's going to be consequences. And Moses had to live in that consequence. And, but that's not the end of the story. This sin did not define Moses. Turn to Deuteronomy 34. This is the end. This is where Moses dies. Luckily, the story doesn't end with that moment. Just like your story will not end with your sin. When you sin, that's not the end. God will give you ways out. He will redeem you. Because that's his goal is to make everything sacred and holy, just like the laws have put. So we get to Deuteronomy 34. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then Moses climbed Mount Nebu from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land. So Moses got to see the promised land. Moses had to accept the consequences of sin. So if you, that's the first thing to accepting your identity. Your identity in God, who God calls you to be, you've got to accept consequences for the sins you make. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. See, Moses didn't get to go to the promised land. Many times, Moses pleaded with God, God, Forgive me, I made a mistake. Let me go into the promised land. And he says, no, you are just as rebellious as that generation that rebelled against you. You will not enter the promised land. You will not enter it. But I want you to do this. I want you to go up on this mountain because I'm going to show you the promised land. Now, flip over back. If you continue reading in verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised to know to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over it into it. Then skip to verse 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. He's 120. And God says, Moses... I want you to climb the highest mountain that you see. This mountain is the highest part of all of the land. It's the highest point of view. It's probably five, it's approximately 5,000 meters high, which is about five miles high. He's 120 and he hikes the way up. Honestly, if you came to me and said, Tad, I want you to hike up a five mile high mountain, I'm going to go, nah, I'm good. And I'm 40. At 120, Moses could have said, no, nah, I don't think so. I'll just send Joshua up to look at it. It's fine. He's seen it before. Joshua, he, I'm sure he can draw. He's fine. He'll go up there. He'll paint a picture. He'll bring it down. He'll tell me, it's okay. My time has ended. I'm not going to get to go in the promised land. I'm just going to, I'm not going to do that. God, that's, that's, that's wasted effort. But he doesn't. Once again, if it was me, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm not walking up there. I don't camp. We learned that last week. Hiking to me. I may hike a couple of miles, but usually it's with a golf club in my hand and I'm walking through woods and, and sand and up hills and down hills. And, you know, but that's the closest to hiking I'm getting. But to climb up a mountain just to see, I don't know if it'd be worth it. But for Moses, it was. Because even though he knew he couldn't enter in it, he was still obedient. He was still determined. I love the the verse in 7 where it says, His eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Moses could have kept going. He could have kept leading. He could have been defiant and he could have said, God, I don't care what you say. I'm going to enter into this promise. I'm getting what is mine. I've worked hard for this. I am entitled to this. But as leaders, 
sometimes you don't get to see the benefits of your labor. Sometimes you're leading in a vision God's given you and you don't get to see it full. It also happened with David. David had this vision from God that said, I need to build this temple. God's presence does not mean an immovable tabernacle anymore. I need to build the biggest building, this great temple that will rest where God's presence is and we can go to Him. He doesn't need to move with us. Let's go with Him. It's going to be grand. He drew, the build, he drew all the plans based on God's guidance and God says you're not entering into it. You don't get to see it built. Why? Because you sinned against me. Because you committed adultery. You committed murder. You took matters in your own hands when there were times when you should have been a holy leader and you were not a holy leader. Therefore, your son will reap those benefits. Moses had to accept the consequences, and he did. He accepted it. Even though motions were high and he lost control, I imagine that walk up the mountain was a moment of instruction as well. Seeing that he had to make a path, knowing that it was hard, probably seeing the times he slipped, thinking and reflecting about his life. But at the top, he saw God's promise. He saw that it was worth it. Because just to see a glimpse of God's promise is enough, should be enough for us. It also says in verse 5 that Moses is the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord, which is, is, is a title that's been reserved for many people. He was a leader, and, but he had to understand what leadership really was. Leadership is not about his glory. Leadership is not about people pointing to him, people looking after him, creating memorials for him. No, it's about having the name servant of the Lord. Only a handful of people in the Bible have the title servant of the Lord. And Moses is one of them. Even though he sinned. See, the goodness is that when you sin and you're broken, if you confess those sins and you get right with God, you still can be a servant of the Lord. Servant means obedience. Which means you've got to be obedient when it's tough. One scholar said that Moses took a group of self-willed, stiff-necked people loosely knit together by religion and blood and welded them into a nation. His enthusiasm... His drive, His keen judgment, His complete dedication to Yahweh inspired them to deeds that would never have deemed possible. He was a great leader because he obeyed and listened to God most of the time. But he was humble. And he also learned that it wasn't about him and he would not lead forever. He needed to replicate the leadership. Verse 9. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. He said, I know my job's not done. God's job is not done. God's job does not end with me. God's job does not end with you. So you need to come along and replicate yourself. Replicate God's vision to other people, which is what Moses did. He said, Joshua, I want you to come alongside. And Joshua led like Moses did. The Israelites were distraught. They mourned for 30 days after Moses died. Do you know how long they mourned for Saul, the first king of Israel? Seven. It's a big deal. They were lost, but they wasn't because Joshua was right there. And Moses knew the end of his life was going to come and he did not want the plan to finish. So he said, Joshua, I'm going to teach you what God's taught me. God has given me guidance. God is with me. God is with you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear, for God is with you. Is what Moses told Joshua more times than anything else. And Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land through hardships, through tough trials. And do you know who else is called a servant of the Lord? Joshua. So to understand, to accept the consequences of sin is not the end. You've got to understand the leadership. Understand that you need to replicate yourself. Our leaders have done a great job. Deacons have done a great job. Our elders are doing a great job. You know, we have, we have ordained and installed new deacons and elders in the last couple of years. We're pouring in. We have more teachers. We have more people wanting to teach. But don't stop. 
Don't stop. Your job's not done. As long as you're breathing the job, your, your job is still here to bring glory to God, to bring holiness to Him. Because our third thing is we've got to recognize that God, it's God's sanctification is what's, is what's important. He is sanctifying us. He sanctified Moses. Even when Moses didn't deserve it, he continued to work with him and brought him to sanctification because God is holy. When Moses died, he said, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. As the Lord had said, he buried him in Moab in the valley opposite of Beth Por. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. No one knows where Moses' grave is. Think about a leader in your life, an instrumental leader that you, you've admired and researched. A lot of times you find out where they're buried. Pay your respects. Several years ago, my wife and I had an opportunity to go to New York by ourselves. And that was the time when the musical Hamilton came out. And I have always loved revolution history. I love the American Revolution. I've read books. You know, it's just something that I've been fascinated about. The founding fathers are people that I've looked into. And at that time, I'd got to know Alexander Hamilton, who was a founding father. First Secretary of Treasury. Built the Coast Guard. Did some amazing things. Helped us lead. Was George Washington's secretary who was able to pen words to get the Constitution that we hold true and valid. Great leader for our nation. And so that day, we, he's buried in New York at Trinity Church. So we made, my wife and I made intentional plans to go down to Trinity Church and see where he's buried. There's a lot of things in New York to see. And it's right there off of Wall Street. And we did, and we planned, and it was great. His grave is right there. His wife's close by. People were coming by, and they were laying, you know, roses on there and flowers, and you pay your respects. And as I'm thinking through that, why? Because if you know the story of Alexander Hamilton, he was not the greatest guy. He was a murderer, an adulterer, someone that let his mouth get ahead of him sometimes led people to ruin and even died in a duel because he couldn't let his pride go. And here I am going down to this person because I admire. And that's why Moses doesn't have a grave. This is someone that the Israelites, they, they mourned for 30 days. And so God says, we don't need to create a memorial for him because it's not about him. It's about God. It's about His holiness. It's about His goodness. And as humans, we would make an idol out of Moses' grave. There's not many places, and in fact, I couldn't find anywhere else in the Bible, and I know there's other scholars in the room, and maybe you can find it, but this is the only place I can find where God buries someone. Enoch walked with God and then was no more. Melchizedek has no beginning or no end. Elijah was brought up in a fiery, fiery chariot, but Moses was buried by God in the valley. Because it's not, we cannot get our own sanctification. We cannot become holy by ourselves. We need God. We need God's presence, which in verse 10 it says, Since then no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Now, as I was reading that, it didn't feel complete to me. And I did something that you, you sh probably shouldn't do, but I wrote two words after that sentence. The sentence reads, For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel until Jesus. Jesus was the prophet that was perfect. Jesus was the one that Moses pointed people to. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Moses was a servant of the Lord, a servant in the Lord's house, but Jesus is the house. Jesus is the one that can make you holy. Jesus is the one that can make you complete. Jesus is the one that can help you be sanctified. But you've got to look to Him. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For God sent his son Jesus to save you. Not to condemn you, but to save you. For the old is gone and the new is come. If you focus on Jesus, your sin does not define you. Are there consequences? Yes. And you be determined, obedient, you live them out the best you can to show people the holiness of God. Is leadership easy? No, leadership's tough. And you've got to accept the responsibility and it's humbling. It's a moment where you've got to pass on God's holiness to generations. And then you've got to recognize that God is working in your life to bring you closer to him. In a couple weeks, Pastor Chris is going to talk through Matthew and he's going to get to the Sermon on the Mount. Which is Jesus pointing to them and saying, it's not about the 600 rules that you see to manage your sin. The goal is to be holy for your heavenly Father is holy. To be perfect for your heavenly Father is perfect. Because you have heard it said, do not, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you commit lust in your heart, you have commit adultery to God. For you have heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you that if you have anger in your heart and call someone a fool... You have committed murder in your heart because at the end of the day, it's about your holiness to God. And you can only come to your holiness through Jesus. You're broken. Seek Jesus. He can fix your brokenness. He went to the cross to wipe away your sin. He went to the cross to tell you that you're okay. Your hope is not on your own self. Your hope is not on the the other things of this world. The hope is not in leaders, human leaders. Your hope is in God. And Jesus shows that through the cross. Shows forgiveness by paying the penalty for your sin. And then rising three days from the grave to say your hope is not in a grave. It's not in a memorial. It's not a place you have to go. You can enter into God's presence right now through Jesus. But look to that. Look to the cross. Look to His salvation. Look to the hope of the empty grave. But then commit. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now is the time to turn your sins to God. Face your consequences. Accept them. But then join in the sanctification of God through Jesus as the perfecter of our faith. The one that leads the way to the face of God. When you commit to following Him, you're committing your life to work through. And oh, what a joy it would be to be called a servant of the Lord. As we sing our last song, That's my prayer. My prayer is that you will recognize how unholy you are. How you need Jesus more than anything. As you need Him to fix the wrongs of your life. To focus that you need His passion, His grace, and His mercy. So that when we leave, we can be holy. We are the holy people. We are the chosen holy people of God. Through Jesus. So go live it this week. Maybe you need to confess your sins this morning. Maybe you need to say, I need a community to help me. But find out how God is sanctifying you today. As you're standing and we get ready to sing, I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy. You are the Prince of Peace. You are our hope. It's a simple gospel of just slaying aside all of the things we have so that we can focus on you. Separating our own desires to focus on your desires. Take away the distractions this moment. Lay them at your feet so that we can walk out with you and be holy. For we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.